So, um, so what we're going to try to do today is, is just talk about some energy efficiency things. You, it, it, it's probably going to be a lot of things that you've heard before. Um, if, you're, um, if you're familiar with the Energy Star program, uh, a lot of this stuff comes there. Or from BOMA, they have uh, some nice information as well um, regarding energy efficiency in buildings. But kind of what we want to talk about was kind of how to implement an energy management plan and then what some of those different strategies might look like. Um, we're we're going to um, present a couple of case studies. And then I was hoping at the end that we could maybe have a little bit of an open dialogue to, to share some of your experiences and lessons learned in, in implementing some of these things, because I'm sure you've had some success as well as some things that you might have done differently if you'd had a chance to do it again. So why save energy? Um, does anybody know what the average energy commercial buildings waste a year? It's, it's about 30%. That's quite a bit of energy. And, and you could um, generally um, see about 10% savings just by doing very simple, low-cost items or things that don't cost money at all. And, and why would we do it? It's, it's good business. It's, it's energy wasted is lost revenue. And, um, and you're, and you're just giving your money to the utilities instead of keeping it in your own pocket. So there's, there's good reasons to do it. Well, let's talk about um, <clears throat> energy um, audits, or, or maybe a better word for that is assessments. Um, if, you, if you follow the ASHRAE um, uh, methods, there's a preliminary energy analysis that needs to be done. And that generally takes your utility bills and, and uh, benchmarks them to determine an energy utilization index. And a really good place I like to start is with Energy Star in their uh, building portfolio program. You can take your, your um, energy bills, you can put them into the website that they have. You can also enter things like the number of people you have, um, uh, your plug loads and some other things, and it kind of normalizes it for the industry and then it gives you a score um, based on your building versus all the other buildings that are in the portfolio. So if, if you're a 50, then it means that 50% that of the buildings out there are more energy efficient than you, or you're more energy efficient than 50. If you're a 75, you're more energy efficient than 75% of the buildings out there in, in the program. And so to, to get an Energy Star rating, you have to be a 75 or higher. And that's probably where they get that data from of, of, of that 30% energy is wasted because uh, people in the portfolio probably are 70 and below on average. <clears throat> uh, ASHRAE has, a, has three different defined levels of energy uh, assessments. One's a, a level one, it's a, a walkthrough analysis. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. You walk through the building, you kind of look and see what things visually that you might be able to to do to save energy. Um, during those walkthroughs, it also identifies potential capital improvements um, to take forward and, and uh, prioritize for level uh, two or level three. The level two is an energy survey and analysis. It's a little bit more detailed and involves um, uh, collecting more data includes energy consumption and demand analysis, um, generally includes interviews with staff and building management to identify um, operational issues. And uh, it, its uh, main goal is to, to identify energy efficiency measures uh, related to the building uh, operation and maintenance procedures. Of course, you know, it has to take into consideration um, what, your, um, what your constraints are as an owner or an operator and your economic criteria. Because there may be things associated with your lease that you're not able to do with your tenant's leases. Um, it can identify some capital intensive improvements for further analysis as part of level three. So with the level three, um, it's, it's gonna be a more detailed field collection. We might put data acquisition devices out in the field. We might wanna uh, measure loads separately electrically to, to get, kind of get a, a, a way, uh, an idea of how the building uses energy. Um, we might do some energy modeling. We might look at some different um, options for 
um, different systems that we might want to do or different ways of uh, modifying what's out there so it is more energy efficient. In the end, what we should end up with is a, detail, a detailed project cost, savings calculations, and, and um, looking at it from a life cycle cost and, um, perspective to make decisions. Uh, ASHRAE has this chart in, in, um, in the energy assessment uh, procedures manual, and, uh, and it goes through all the different things that need to be done or should be done and which ones happen at each level. So that if you're out there and you hire a consultant to do a, um, an energy assessment for you, you'll know kind of what you should expect in the scope. Personally, I, I, I tend to combine a couple of them. Like I, I can do a lot of what's in an, uh, um, a level two as part of a level one. You know, it doesn't have to follow this, but it's just a guide to, to kind of guide you through that process. So there's really three uh, different types of, um, of ways to save energy or ways to look at it. There's occup occupant behavior, how your, how your tenants or, um, or employees or other occupants behave in the building. There's operational things um, that can occur. Uh, when, when you do, um, for instance, uh, janitorial services, whether it happens late at night when nobody's in the building using lights and, and um, other energy or whether it's happening during the day. Uh, and there's physical aspects, you know, there are things get broke or things aren't operated correctly um, over time. So let's talk about occupant behavior a little bit. It, it's creating awareness. It's kind of energy, energy savings or energy efficiency is sometimes uh, kind of like a, um, a state of mind. I and mean, we've all heard it growing up as kids, I mean I did, turn the lights off, you know. Uh, why did you leave the lights on in the bathroom? Those types of things. And maybe it, it didn't really hit home until we started paying for the lights ourselves. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's turning the light off when you leave the room. But, but um, creating some communication and energy management goals and communicating those to um, the people in the building. Identifying areas where everyone can contribute to that. Um, energy Star has a lot of um, resources on their website of uh, printed collateral that you can use, uh, posters you can put up. Um, you need to modify the message for each group. You wouldn't uh, want the same message going to your um, operational staff as what might go to your tenants or, or other employees. Um, you can provide access to information. There's a, a lot of good tools out there that you can make uh, web accessible so that people can actually visually see where the energy is being used in the building and how it's being used. And you can share that with them. Um, posters, emails, web portals, um, even light switch covers that you can put on or get to, to remind people, hey, turn the lights off. It's like uh, most of the restaurants we go to, reminding the employees to wash their hands when they leave the restroom. So eliminating waste. Well, let's talk about some, some things that are pretty easy to do. Um, uh, we refer to them as low-hanging fruit, but, but just remember, as you pick that fruit, it has a tendency to grow back. So you have to continually keep going back and looking at these things. Uh, just because you go through and do it once doesn't mean that it won't come back, come back again. One of the, one of the um, things that's recommended, and it's kind of interesting, is to do a nighttime audit. You can go, go by your building at night and you can see what lights are on you know, from the street. Or you can go in and, and see that, oh wow, that pump is running. Why is that pump running? It's not supposed to be running tonight. You, know, you can identify those things that you might not be able to see without um, being there at that time. It works for the, on the weekends too. Uh, the worst time I find to do this is um, during football season on Monday night. Um, because, or, or when the Royals are playing, because I don't like to do them then. <laughs> but at any rate, to each their own. So find out what's going on, so that, uh, what's on that shouldn't be on. And then um, another thing, especially if you have uh, building automation systems, is to optimize the start and stop. You know, there's certain, you know, you, some people know that, hey, I've got to turn the air conditioning on two hours before people get into the building or, or the building won't be cooled back down yet. Or, or when to turn it off at night when to power down. You can revise your janitorial staff 
um, when uh, services to to um, happen some of it during the day so that they're not out there so late in the evening doing those services with the lights on and and all their equipment that's working um, same thing with security you know if you have folks that are walking through the building doing security maybe they can do that at the same time that that um, your janitorial staff is working so that you can kind of use the lights together or have the security guys go through after to make sure all the lights are turned off you can visually inspect uh, insulation for damage or tears I mean if, if you have pipe that's not insulated that heat or that cooling is is going somewhere else or it could be causing other problems um, you can see a 10 to 40 percent reduction in your lighting power just by making sure the lights are off um, adjust the thermostat so I mean Jimmy Carter figured this one out you, you move the thermostat up a degree and it saves three percent on your energy associated with the, the heating and cooling so uh, some of us are old enough to remember that I, I know I was um, adjust those thermostats for seasonal change there's there's some folks that have just one thermostat and um, and we might have it set for 75 during cooling but you don't want to set 75 during heating so when you change over to season you might want to set it back to 68 or 70 um, reducing lighting um, um, we've all probably experienced um, lighting retrofits, but um, most office buildings, their, their lighting is 50 to 60 percent overlit. It's a lot. And you don't have to go take fixtures out, just unscrew some of the, uh, the lamps. You know, two lamps out of a four lamp fixture. Uh, I, I would recommend doing it during the day when everybody's there, because then they're going to notice the light level change but if you if you did it over time they're probably not going to really notice it and they're going to be able to work just fine especially when it's overlit um, use shades or blinds during the summer to, to keep that heat from coming out um, you don't have to close the blind just lower it lowering the blind will help reflect some of that radiant heat out of the space and you can still see out and have your views turn off office equipment at night um, um, thirty percent of the energy used in the building is related to plug loads that's a lot if they're left on if copiers are left on at night or, or printers um, it's, a, it's a lot it can add up um, set those computers in in the um, in the the um, copiers to sleep mode energy star says that you'll save forty percent if you have to replace one replace it with an energy star that has those built-in features to it It'll also save on the air conditioning too. So there, there's things that, that do cost money or, or a small amount of money. When you have lights that, um, lamps that go out, you can replace incandescent with compact fluorescent. Or you can uh, replace your incandescent lights and your exit lights with LEDs. Um, it's 95% savings associated with the energy used by those guys. So it can add up, especially if you have a large building. Um, LED replacement, they now make them for MR16s, PAR38s, and in, um, in, uh, regular uh, T5s or T8s. And, and remember that um, in oftentimes lighting is, is over designed by 50 to 60 percent. So just because you're going in and replacing fixtures, um, perhaps maybe you don't have to have as many fixtures so your cost isn't going to be as high it won't necessarily be a one-to-one -one replacement uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, when we get to a case study that we did um, occupancy sensors can reduce um, light usage by 40 percent um, using smart power strips for plug loads um, they call them vampires they um, just if your laptop it may be off but um, but your DC converter down here it's still it's still powered up it's still using energy so you can buy those that are smart so they go off when the when the unit stops charging when its battery's full it'll actually go off um, or you can get some that, that go off automatically you can you can get some that are hooked up to to your Wi-Fi so you can measure what's happening um, interesting enough I, I knew a, a, a company that 
could tell when their employees were working late at night because they could watch on their Wi-Fi, they could see when the plug loads were on and when they weren't at each specific desk in the building. So there might be some additional uses for that kind of thing too. And, and um, by the way, these things pay back in a matter of weeks. It, it just takes very little time. Within a, a month, you could save enough energy to pay for one of these guys. I mean, they're $20. It's not a lot. HVAC, if, if, you're, if you're not using programmable thermostats or, or have a building automation system, you know, these are, are um, very cost-effective tools now to, to be able to schedule your air conditioning on and off. Um, we talked about blinds earlier, but if you have an area that you're having trouble with or, or um, want to cut down, back on some heat, you can install blinds to, to help that situation out. Um, of course, one thing we like is preventive maintenance contracts. We're, we're, we're happy to, to sell you one, one of those as well. So let's talk about plumbing a little bit because we have a tendency to focus on HVAC and lighting and plug loads when we're talking about energy savings, but there's a lot of uh, water that's wasted as well. And, and using water, water sense fixtures um, is a rating that um, it's for energy efficient fixtures. Um, if you have a lot, if you have a facilities with a lot of sinks, a lot of faucets, you can change out that aerator. It's, it's not, it's a $2 item or less. It's not a big deal. And um, they go as low as 0.35 GPM instead of the industry standard of 2.2. And so when you think about that, um, if we're able to reduce the amount of water that we're using at that fixture, we're also going to, we could be reducing the amount of hot water that we're using that takes energy to, to make it hot. So you're saving on two, two ends of the spectrum there. Um, um, they can save as much as 700 gallons of faucet annually. Use point of use water heating. It can reduce your um, heating costs for water 27 to 50 percent. Low, low flow urinals can save 50 percent or more water. The, the industry standard is one gallon per flush. Um, you could easily, a gallon, think of that, a gallon, gallon jug, that big. Every time you flush urinal, that's how much water goes down that urinal. A whole gallon. Does that seem like a lot? It seems like a lot to me. It's like pouring a gallon of milk down there. Well, you can go as low as a pint. That's beer. You wouldn't pour that down. No. I'd pour the milk down before I pour the beer down. Yeah, let's make sure we clarify that. But, but it, it's something to think about. You know, I, I went to the hockey game last week at the Sprint Center. And they're all one gallon per flush urinals, and there's like, what, 20 or 30 of them in one bathroom? And they get used a lot. The airport, they get used a lot. I mean, that's a lot of water. It takes energy, maybe not in the building, but it takes energy to get that water to the building, you know, if you think about it. So something to think about. And I think, you know, water is not um, a resource here in, in the Midwest that's thought of as, as um, highly valuable, but I think um, places like, you know, Colorado and New Mexico and other places, it's getting uh, uh, to be a problem. They say it's the resource that we're going to run out of first is, is drinkable water. All right, I'm off my little water rant. Has everybody heard about commissioning? Heard the word commissioning quite a bit? I get asked a lot, well, what really is commissioning? And it's basically, it's, it's just a comprehensive and systematic testing of the system to make sure that it's operating the way it's supposed to. And it's documenting that so that you know going down the road, you can look back and see, yeah, um, it was working then, something happened, it's not working now. So that you can go back and, and make improvements when things aren't working correctly. Um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories out uh, in, um, in Tennessee did a study of 643 buildings, um, over a, 100 million square feet. And it revealed that there were over 10,000 energy related um, deficiencies in those buildings. Uh, of that, about six, there was a, about a median of 16% energy improvement that would have been um, accomplished fixing all those things that they found wrong. In, um, 
it, it resulted in a 58 page you know report it's it's huge and there's everything in there that you can imagine the National Building Institute did a study um, here recently out in um, um, California area on 503 rooftops uh, rooftops on buildings um, at approximately 181 buildings and this is a chart of all the deficiencies that, the deficiencies that they found um, 64 percent of the units had failed or broken economizers so you know we use economizers to do cooling with outdoor air instead of running compressors well if they're not working they're obviously not accomplishing what they're supposed to they found that the, that had those economizers been fixed or adjusted that there'd be a 14 to 40 percent energy savings depending on what the exact issue was they found 58 percent thermostat problems the wrong thermostat and we just had a job here recently that um, just last week Daryl right where um, they've had a, a cooling problem in a space for the last two or three years and when they found out that whoever installed it they installed a single stage thermostat on a two stage unit so it was never going in the second stage so guess what the space was never satisfied so the unit ran all the time trying to satisfy it so you know not only was there a comfort issue but there was also an energy issue with that um, not having uh, I can't tell you how many thermostats I've walked up to seven day programmable thermostats that have no program in them it happens a lot and with some really smart folks you would think that they would have a schedule in there um, but they don't they, they claim that um, that if those um, stat problems have been fixed that they, they would show a 40 percent energy savings on cooling 40 uh, 46 percent refrigeration circuit issues whether they were um, high or low and, um, and their criteria was whether it was five percent high or low they, they figured that there was a five to eleven percent um, savings on cooling energy because of refrigeration circuit issues 42 percent airflow issues so either the air was was too high or too low um, their, their criteria was if it was 25 percent high or low then they considered it an issue and so that not, not only is going to affect how much energy you use because you're not satisfying the thermostat early enough but it also is going to affect humidity in the space as well so there's a, a number of different issues associated with that they found that those were fixed that they estimated about a 10 percent saving in cooling energy so then those are just some of the easy things you know the the things that don't cost that much to do to save energy so then we get to the big stuff that we really like equipment replacement and systems upgrades anybody got a boiler like that sitting in their building right now is that a new high efficiency boiler? Yeah, brand new. That's why it's got water leaking out of it. Well, if you do, it's time to replace it. Um, if, you, if you have chillers that, that are, are 10, 15 years old, there's a good chance that we can find chillers that are more efficient. And I'm not a big advocate of going in, well, I can get a, a boiler or a chiller that's more efficient, so let's just replace that one that's 10 or 15 years old. But if it, if it needs replacing that's the time to, to address that and get something a lot more efficient um, and, and there's ways to, to run these things more efficiently than they were set than they were intended to as well um, if, if um, and, and, there, and believe it or not there are still a lot of boilers installed in, in buildings that look like that that were installed some even older that were installed around the turn of the century um, believe it or not and, and a lot of them are steam and, and they're using steam to make hot water and, um, and you can get a 50s to 60 percent energy savings just converting that over to hot water instead of steam um, a lot of these um, older systems require a lot of maintenance most of them aren't um, aren't up to date with codes either so there's some things that you can do you can avoid some of those maintenance costs and some of those code upgrades if you're forced to um, adding DDC controls you can save 20 to 30 percent in your energy if, if you don't currently have control systems in your building and there are still a lot of buildings out there that have nothing but 
a direct acting thermostat running their equipment. So it's going to so it's going to run 24/7 or until someone turns it off. Cooling tire replacements there's a there's a lot of new technology out there with variable speed fans and some other things. Upgrading constant volume uh, pumping systems to um, variable volume. Um, even on systems that weren't necessarily intended to be a variable volume system. This is a, um, I was involved in a, a program that I did with Leavenworth School District where we replaced just about every older boiler out there and in, in, in occurred over um, a process of about three years. At the end, we, we were able to reduce their um, gas consumption by over 50%. So it's, it's kind of a success story, but the majority of that um, wasn't to save energy. The energy savings just kind of helped justify um, cost-wise upgrading their systems because they, were, they didn't meet code and, and they were having a lot of maintenance issues. You can see here, this was one analysis on one of the schools that we did. The system was oversized by, by two and a quarter, oversizing for one. So we were able to go back and put smaller systems in. Um, uh, the maintenance that they were doing on that system a year was uh, about $8,000 a year. So it was uh, pretty costly. So in the end, um, when you take all those things into account, you end up with about a five-year payback. And that's if the gas prices don't go up. I think a lot of people here remember when the gas prices went up, um, what was that, 99, 2000, 2001, where they, you know, went up triple, quadruple what they were. That was a year we did a lot of boiler replacements. This is a, this is a list of uh, uh, several of the schools that we've done and, and the savings associated with them. So it can be pretty, pretty substantial. So what's a good candidate for that? Um, any, any building that uses lies of steam, boilers to make hot water. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, buildings, high-rise apartments, that they'll have a steam boiler in the basement, and they'll have a, um, um, a heat exchanger there as well. And so they send steam to the heat exchanger, and then on the other side of the heat exchanger, they have water going. We can get rid of that heat exchanger and go strictly to um, a hot water boiler and save a lot of energy. There's a lot of systems that use that, that. There's a lot of buildings that use that same kind of system to heat potable water, not just to do heating, but to heat the potable water. A lot of apartment complexes will do that. Um, I've seen swimming pool heaters heated with steam boilers. Same situation. Systems that operate all year long, um, which there are some. I, I know right now of an apartment complex that uses their steam boiler all year long. They make potable hot water with it, all year long, they make water to heat their um, swimming pool all year long, and then they also use it for heating in the heating season. But it's a lot of energy gone wasted. Basically, most, most systems installed prior to 1980, the technology is there now, uh, the efficiency in, in, in systems to make huge improvements to it. And of course, the bigger the, the heating plant, the more savings there's going to be. Um, just another case study here, um, KU Endowment, uh, it's their office building out in, um, in Lawrence. They, um, they had a lot of uh, issues, uh, comfort issues in the building, and they said, hey, um, come in and, and let's do a study on what types of things we could do to the building, not only to improve our, our comfort issues, but also to um, reduce energy because it was one way they were going to try to justify using it. And the KU Endowment, they are not-for-profit, so it's, they couldn't take advantage of any sort of tax um, incentives to do that. Well, one of the things we did is we updated the old pneumatic controls to DDC. Um, it allowed us to do scheduling, optimization algorithms, doing supplier reset and dead band control, the things we couldn't do with what they had. We upgraded the boilers uh, from, I think the existing one was um, nominally 75% to a new condensing boiler that was upwards in the 90% range. 
we did a lighting upgrade. This is a good example of um, lighting that was over designed when the building was built. It, it was about 1.1 watt per square foot. We were able to reduce it to 0.68 watts per square foot just by uh, improving the lighting that was there and getting, and getting very acceptable lighting levels um, in there as well. We replaced the uh, perimeter VAV reheat boxes. They were cooling only boxes with, with hot water coils in them. We were able to replace those with fan powered units so that they could, um, their first stage of heating was to recirculate the return air in the system with, uh, with reheat and CO2 controls. This was um, when we uh, did the study, um, we came up with all these different options Option E is to do them all, and, and it shows about a, a little over 44% energy savings right here to do them all. So, you know, when, you have, when you're spending a capital cost of um, 400 and some thousand dollars, almost $500,000, you want to try to, to justify it as much as you can. So fixing all the things that need to be fixed, as well as doing the energy efficiency, help justify that, even though the payback is out there a ways. Um, the good news is, is that this is what the energy model showed that we did, that, the, that, the consult, that our consultant did, and um, the savings that they're actually getting out there now that's been operating for two years is 40 percent. So I would say if you got within 4 percent in your energy model um, and, and you're really finding out that you're saving 40 percent, I, I would say that's pretty good success. Of course, they hired a good contractor to put it in, too. So that's, that always helps. So that, that, that's about, um, and, and what they have done now is instead of having a $120,000 budget for energy, they now have a $95,000 budget for energy. So they're, they're, they carried it through on their budgeting program. So how can, how can we help? Um, we can certainly um, perform energy assessments for you. We could do systems commissioning, energy modeling, you know, um, budgeting, system upgrades. We really like to do those. And, and we can provide a turnkey solution. We can provide the engineering, the budgeting, the construction. If, you, if, if we're going to do a lighting retrofit program as well, well, we'll team up with folks that will do that with us. But we can, we can certainly perform an analysis for all of it. Um, we can even help you with financing. Uh, Bill's got a, good, a big pocketbook that he's got tons of money in. I didn't know that. You didn't know that? <laughs> um, no, but actually we, we, can help you, um, we can help you apply for rebates if, if you're in an area that allows for that, Kansas City Power and Light. There's also some tax incentives. Uh, have, have, has everybody heard of 179D tax? It's a, it's a, a tax line in the code that allows you to get um, a, um, a deduction for doing energy efficiency upgrades to your building. It actually ended um, in January, but there's um, a big push right now through Congress to get it um, extended. Um, they're saying through 2014, but the big push is for it to be just part of the regular tax code period with no expiration date on it whatsoever. And, and a lot of folks have been able to take advantage of that. Um, and what's even nice about it is if, um, if say, you're a, a public entity, a school district, or, or not-for-profit, um, the design team can, can take advantage of that deduction by, by helping you get a more energy efficient um, solution. There's also um, a program that was passed um, in 2010. It's called the Property Assessed Clean Energy District. Is, has anybody heard of this? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a unique way of, of being able to raise funding. Um, it's not really a loan, it's a tax assessment, and it can be transferred to owners as, as a building is uh, sold. So it's, it's, it should be something that everyone should actually um, consider. And, um, yeah, Valerie? Uh, I, I would like to see, can we go over, you know, we can say that GMI can help, obviously, but how long do some of these things take? Because I know property managers, they're, they're going through budgets in October right now, um, so it's kind of difficult to 
spreading themselves fairly thin. But if they can do something within two weeks or a month, or what is the natural time frame for some of these performing an energy assessment or system conditioning? Jason, what we've done a couple of ASHRAE level one um, audits here recently, two or three hours max, maybe an hour, um, and and we can do some. You know, it's it's walking through the building and say, "Wow, you've got T12s up there," you know doesn't happen as often as it was happening, but we're still running into situations like that. Or, or you know, um, HID lamps. I mean, there's a lot of things out there that, that are, are um, still, still working. Or, or just seeing that you've got a thermostat that is um, it's, it's not networked or there's no programming ability to it or whatsoever. And, and I think Bill has a customer where they're basically running their system 24-7. And so when you think about those things, those, there's lots of opportunities to save energy and get a lot of that covered through rebates and these other programs so that you're not, you know, um, shelling out the, the dollars for all of it, just a portion of it. And especially when you do things like this, it, it improves um, comfort in the building. It improves, um, it adds um, value to your building, your asset. So there are lots of things to think about. So has, has uh, anybody had any um, good success in implementing an energy efficiency project? Yeah. We, at my company, we uh, <clears throat> did the lighting. We used to have HO and PHO lamps out there, and we went all the TAs. Our payoff was two years. Two years? So he did a, um, he did a lighting retrofit. Um, um, going to T8 lamps and, and got a payback of about two years. That's that's really good. And there, was, there was about 200 to 250 lamps that we replaced. Yeah. Is there anything you would have done differently about that? No. So you were pretty happy with how it turned out then. Better lighting. The only thing is that it costs more to heat now. Oh yeah, yeah. It might cost more to heat, but it certainly doesn't cost as much to cool. Yeah, Jason. Can you mention chillers and boilers, you know, as a big possibility for energy savings, but how's the volume of rooftop units? You see that gets overlooked a lot. So I think that would be a great option for that as well. Yeah, in fact, the, the new units coming out um, next year, if they're, I believe it's over 17 tons, they have to have um, uh, fan speed control and capacity control on the compressors. So something to keep out. And we, we, um, we do have um, some things that we use, catalysts and some other things that really uh, do help uh, turn a constant volume unit into something much more usable and, and energy efficient. So those, those are, that's a good, good point. Yeah. Hey, Jim, on uh, converting pneumatics over to DDC control, has there been any dollars put to or to identify the savings, either down to the VAV box level or I know you mentioned 20 to 30%. In order to calculate what kind of uh, rebate we would request, you know, if I say I've got 450 VAV boxes that are automatic, how would you or KCP and L yeah. determine? You know, I, I've, uh, I've searched quite a bit for those yeah. numbers, and, um, and, and just like you said, I, the numbers I find is anywhere from 20 to 30% is what what is um, uh, stated out there for um, converting DDC over, or converting pneumatics over to DDC. Um, I, I think the reason why is because it's a lot, it's, it's, how you, um, it's how you run your building too. And, and I think that's why it's such a big range. But I have not found anything that says, I mean, you could certainly do energy modeling and figure it out from there. Um, and I don't know how kcp and does it, but it, apparently they, they have a, a way of doing it. I, I should uh, ask them and and find out. Wish I had a better answer. Energy modeling. What exactly is that? It's it's black magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's using programs that have algorithms in there to simulate systems, and so you um, um, you basically it's like. Um, how you do a load analysis for a building. You could do it by hand, but 
Um, you enter the information about your, your windows and your walls and the people and the number of computers and the lights. You enter that into the computer and it simulates different systems for you. So you can have it simulate you know, uh, constant volume rooftop units versus VAV, or you can have it do um, different uh, pump packages on chillers or chilled water versus rooftop units. I mean, just about every system you can imagine is built into these um, programs. And, um, and so um, what I like to do in, in, um, in analyzing a building is I like to get the utility um, bills and try to match the building to the current bills that are being produced as close as possible with the existing system so that you know that your baseline is going to be pretty close to what you have. And then you can model the other systems that you import into there pretty close to it. And it'll give you, a, um, it'll give you an energy usage and cost when you put the utility data in. We're talking about the KYC pulse on the years of the building. How would that to I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. KYC pulse. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. With yeah. Okay, so we that, that looks at your energy consumption. Uh huh. Through a building this electrical meter. Right. So we're, we're talking, just for architects, I'm talking about doing something for that for one of our buildings. Is that anything So just to monitor how the energy is being used in the yeah, building? Then go back into the energy management system uh -huh. to show the energy usage. Then it controls different items from the energy usage. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, with with um, energy monitoring and those types of things, you can do some sophisticated um, strategies with that to, to try to keep your demand load down, or or just to see where the energy is being used, so that you know what types of things that you need to to look at to reduce that energy. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, Jen will stay after for a little bit. If you guys have any other questions, we're going to talk to him or any of our staff here or our other salesmen are here to help. So.